Well, good morning, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to the Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar for today, 1st of November 2013. Sorry, 2023, 10 years ago. Um, my name's Chris Lewis, and I'm the Director of Regional Geology and Drilling here at Geoscience Australia. Um, I'd like to make an acknowledgement to the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing con connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, <coughs> the cultures and the elders past and present. Well, like I said, welcome to today's Wednesday seminar, which I'm pleased to say is will be presented by our eminent guest speaker, Professor Tom Raimondo from the University of South Australia. Tom's talk today is titled Towards the Exploration Metaverse. As part of the MINEX CRC, Uni University of South Australia's Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments, it has developed three innovative projects that use immersive technologies to work towards the goal of an exploration metaverse. These projects encompass augmented reality core logging, virtual collaboration and visualisation of spatial data sets, and immersive analytics for geoscientific data. This presentation will demonstrate how each of these platforms introduce new tools to enable rapid, rapid data-driven decision-making for geoscientists. An, an additional developing project is the Rocksplorer Digital Twin that will be used to optimise engineering and user workflows of coiled tube drilling sites, train drillers on the new platform, and act as a technology showcase for stakeholder engagement and commercialisation. Finally, no metaverse would be complete without a stunning visual world to explore. So what better excuse to showcase an, an immersive reconstruction of the Flinders Ranges and its rich geological archive of the evolution of life on Earth through the 360, Flinder, 360 degree Flinders Ranges project, a virtual reality experience in support of World Heritage Noah Nation for this region. About Professor Tom Raimondo. Well, as the title suggests, Tom is Professor of Geology and Geochemistry, as well as Dean of Programs of, for STEM at the University of South Australia. His research, his research spans geology and geochemistry, data analytics and visualisation, immersive technology and digital twins. He's also a passionate science communicator who has been recognised as the 2019 South Australian Science Excellence Awards STEM Educator of the Year and in 2017, was named the ABC Top 5 Under 40. Since 2014, Tom has led Project LIVE, LIVE standing for Learning Through Immersive Virtual Environments, an initiative focused on creating high quality virtual and augmented reality experiences that bridge the research teaching nexus. Tom is also a member of the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments. Please join me in welcoming Tom. Thanks a lot, Chris, for that introduction, and thanks to you all for, for being here today to um, see a little bit about what we've been up to recently in the VR and AR space um, with a number of different projects that Chris mentioned. Um, so, um, firstly, um, whilst I'll be the person presenting today, of course, not everything today is is exclusively my work. There's a there's a huge number of people that have contributed to what you're going to see. Um, the key names are the ones that you can see there listed at the bottom of the presentation. Jack uh, Fraser, Andrew Cunningham and Bruce Thomas were all part of, as Chris mentioned, the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments that I'll introduce uh, in a minute. Um, and have had a, a really key role in many of the different uh, flavours of VR and AR applications that you're going to see today. So just to give you a little bit of insight into what you're going to see today, Chris gave you a bit of a summary, mentioning each of the different platforms you can see mentioned there, Log AR, OzMap, IMAX's Geo, the Roxborough Digital Twin and 360 Flinders Ranges. So we've got a lot of ground to cover, um, but we'll try and give you a bit of a taste, I guess, of each of those, um, how they're using VR and AR technologies to do something a little bit differently, to give us some new insights, um, hopefully, into the way that we deal with geoscientific data, the way that we use that to form our uh, interpretations and analysis of, of these type of things, um, and the way that we vis can visualise things differently as well. Um, and I'll preface all of that with a bit of an introduction to who we are at IVE and what we mean by this concept of the exploration metaverse. So to kick things off, IVE, the Australian Research Centre for Interactive and Virtual Environments. Um, you may not have heard of us. Um, we're actually the largest VR and AR concentration of researchers in the Southern Hemisphere. And it's well over 150 people and growing, um, based at the University of South Australia. 
encompassing all sorts of discipline areas. So obviously with a heart in software engineering and computer science and so on, but broadening that into all sorts of different applications of it. So whether that's in architecture or the built environment or in engineering or in creative arts um, or in data visualization and data analytics and all that sort of stuff. So multiple different ways in which um, we use VR and AI technologies to do things differently, I guess, and push different research angles, I suppose. Um, and we've also got another aspect of today's presentation that you're going to hear a little bit about, as Chris already um, foreshadowed, is Project Live, which is learning through immersive virtual environments. Now, we are a part of the Research Centre IVE, and it's mostly focused on the educational and outreach aspects of the Research Centre, if you like. So that's something that I direct, um, and the website that you can see there has several examples of different projects that we've brought into um, existence, I suppose, that use XR technologies in one form or another to create new learning experiences or communicate things in a different way. Uh, so I do encourage you, and I'll, I'll present some links to various of our projects as we go through today. I would encourage you to go to the website there and check out many of the different um, things that we've been working on where you can follow up on some of the things I'll be presenting today. All right, so the exploration metaverse sounds a little bit weird, perhaps. What do we mean by that? Um, I think. The simplest way for me to explain it in a geoscientific context is the amount of data that we are now surrounded by. I guess uh, whether, we, whether we're working in the exploration space um, or the research space, the amount of information, the amount of data that we have accessible to us and that is really high quality um, is, is rapidly expanding. And, and Geoscience Australia, of course, is at the coalface of all of that, trying to um, really dramatically in increase at the continental scale um, all the way down to the camp and the, and the deposit scale, what we actually have access to, really high quality information of various types that we can use to inform our decision making, uh, inform our insights into many different geological questions. The problem we've got is what we do with all that information. We're inquiring it at a rapid rate, but we don't necessarily have the best tools to interrogate it. Um, that sits within the context of a a commercial market where AR and VR in particular are really rapidly expanding um, in terms of their uptake. We've had players like Apple just enter the market recently, which is really going to change the landscape of that, and other players like Meta, for example. So big players working in the AR and VR space and trying to push into the consumer market um, where people are now starting to get more familiar with these technologies, starting to use them and apply them in different contexts. Um, and the research and the data space is one, I think, which is very ripe for opportunity. So we talk about a lot in IVE about this idea of immersive analytics and space to think. And what that means is we're using all of our 360 degrees of vision around us, if you like, to have different modules of data that we can interact with and interpret. And we can often do that interaction via different techniques because of the virtue of working in an immersive environment. So instead of using a keyboard and mouse, we're using our hands and our eyes to interact with data. Um, and that's a very different approach, I guess, um, to working constrained within a desktop environment. Um, and it does use different parts of your brain because you're interacting with the data in a different way. You're using gestures rather than the traditional keyboard and mouse inputs, for example. You do preserve a lot of the spatial fidelity of your data as well, so things that are 3D are genuinely presented in 3D rather than a 2D abstraction that you see on your monitor. Um, and so this works great for geoscientific data where we need three or even 4D understanding of things to get a true appreciation of exactly what's going on. Um, we need to be able to bridge different scales as well. That's something that works um, extremely well in VR. So these environments, and with the examples I'll show you today to hopefully illustrate this, these immersive environments are very well suited to get the most out of this significant amount of data that we are now acquiring and trying to make sense of. Um, so it's going to enable new ways of thinking, new ways of working with others as well, and I'll talk about the collaborative aspect of these technologies as well. Um, trying to make very high quality, very data informed decisions. That's really what we're aiming for here. Okay, so to the first of our examples, Log AR, which is um, as the name suggests, focused on augmented reality core locking. Now, this project, as many of the ones today are, were born out of the MinEx CRC and, and particularly the Opportunity Fund. Now, you can see some of the project goals that I've listed there and, and really what the motivation behind all of this is. But um, what I want to do to kind of 
preface everything to do with this Log AR project is get you to focus on this set of images here, um, because I think this really does explain the opportunity in a nutshell. Um, these two photos were taken on the same day at the Tonsley Core Library, right at the very beginning of this project, when we first started engaging with the Geological Survey of South Australia, <coughs> um, around the potential of a fully digital workflow to um, to the core logging process, taking it away from the traditional approach, which is mostly pen and paper or databases that are hosted on a laptop that you need to kind of, in a cumbersome way, move between. And the photo on the left shows the actual logging process that was being done on the day. Where there are literally just scraps of paper being placed at particular points of interest um, along the downhole. Um, and that's about it. You know, things that could literally blow away in the breeze um, if, if, if they were allowed to. Um, it's just a single user, it's entirely analog. Um, there's really not a lot of interoperation between different data sets that's going on. It's large, largely relying on expert knowledge um, in order to drive the interpretation, if you like. And you have to be in person. You have to be physically standing in front of the core in order to be able to do this. Contrast that against what you can see on the right, where what we have is <laughs> several of the GSA, GSSA staff using um, some different devices, iPads or HoloLenses, which I'll introduce in a second, to do the logging process in a fully digital workflow. Now you can see there are multiple users doing it all simultaneously. Many of those are networked and linked and sharing their different observations and inputs into the process. Um, all of the data that's being fed to them is done live via the National Virtual Core Library. Um, and you also have the, the capability, as I'll illustrate in a second, to do this remotely. So you don't need to physically be in person at a location in order to do it. Now, the end result of this, of course, is it's questionable whether <coughs> the example on the left, which is the traditional approach, is genuinely data-driven or knowledge-driven and experience-driven, whereas it's unquestionable, I guess, that the example on the right is data-driven. Um, and that allows more efficiency, allows more accuracy, and hopefully allows us to bring new insights into the process, which is really the ultimate goal. So, as I've kind of explained there, um, all of the data that's being fed into this is coming live via things like <coughs> the National Virtual Core Library and many of the web services that are maintained by the individual geological survey organisations. Um, so, there's a lot of data that can be fed into it and made use of in order to inform the decision making process. What I'll also explain a little bit about is the machine learning aspect to this, which I think is a game changer really in terms of how we approach the core logging process and how we can dramatically improve the efficiency of all of this. So I'll, I'll introduce that um, in a second. But just to give you a demo of exactly what this all looks like, rather than me trying to verbally describe it, I'll show you a video now. There is a YouTube link there that you're welcome to check out <laughs> um, after today. Um, I'll give you a, a website which actually summarizes many of the projects that we're going through today to allow you to revisit. Um, but there'll be several individual YouTube links so you can check out uh, just in case the video is not working for you or you do want to revisit any part of the presentation as well. So here it is. So this is what you're presented with when you're looking at it through the HoloLens, which is the first example I'll show. <coughs> um, fully immersive environment where you can see you're starting to use gestures to interact with the data. Um, whether it's a, th a 3D visualizer that you can see here, which kind of places the drill hole into context um, or all the other original data sets, um, or whether it's placing markers and moving them around. So what you can now see is the iPad version <coughs> where you're using a touch screen interface um, to interact with the data and trigger different visualizations and so on. Um, the two do work as in hybrid mode as well. So you can get the benefits of both worlds if you prefer to take it that way. There is also a fully virtual version, which is what you're seeing here, where the user is placed in a, in a VR headset and uses some hand controllers to interact with the data. This is the example I was mentioning where you don't need physical access to the core. It's relying on the scanned imagery data sets from the NVCL in order to visualize and provide data inputs on top of that um, for, for the user to interact with. Now this shows the search functionality that allows you to pull data directly from the NVCL. So it's simply a matter of searching for the drill hole ID. <coughs> and then once that's loaded, you have access, as you can see here, to all of the um, all of the Highlogger Scalars um, and many other data sets that are hosted in the NVCL that you're able to bring into it, whether it's stratigraphy, 
petrophysics, um, um, downhole interpretations that already exist, all of that sort of stuff can be brought in and visualized on the holes themselves. So you've got access to all of that data. If it's hosted on a web service, you can also bring in custom data sets um, via a separate um, locally hosted server, if you like, so that you can visualize any data. If you have any downhole information from any hole that you want to visualize, you can bring that into the system and start to visualize it. So you've got total flexibility in terms of what data you want to visualize and be able to place it in situ so that you can see it. Now, many of the styles of visualizations that you can see here are, are things like um, categorical data that's assigned different colors. Let's say it's a mineral index or something like that. Um, equally, it can be a heat map. If you've got a downhole assay, for example, you want to look at the copper distribution or the arsenic distribution or whatever it might be, <coughs> you can visualize that with a heat map style visualization that you can see there. So there are a number of different ways to modify, threshold the data, um, change the style of visualization to suit you and the type of interpretation you want to do. Some of the other tools that you can see here is, is a simple uh, measuring tool. So no need for a tape measure anymore. You simply just tap on the um, tap on the location and you get an immediate downhole estimate um, and tray number and all of those other IDs. Um, you can also, as you can see here, start to add markers, which are points of interest um, where you can add annotations, notes, photographs, um, all of these different things to indicate um, what your interpretation is and contribute that data as you go along. And the other one you can see here is a, is a digital strat log that you can generate as you're going through, um, assigning each of the boundaries and layers, different attributes, following a particular schema, for example, if you want to um, categorize things according to an agreed set of um, labels that you want to use and categories that you want to use and all that sort of thing. All of this stuff is saved, all of it is spatially tracked so that every user that comes in subsequent to you doing that interpretation has access to everything you've done as part of that previous process. Um, so <laughs> that's that's a bit of a visual uh, summary of the, um, the, the platform and how it works, I guess. Um, as I said, the major advantage of doing all of this is if you think about the number of eyeballs that look at core over its journey from being pulled out of the ground to being stored in um, a core library over a number of years, all of that experience, all of that observation is, is not captured at the moment in any sensible way. If we do this in an entirely digital workflow, every single interpretation, observation, input that anyone does can be captured and archived and that's a massive amount of pre-competitive data that we are now retaining as a consequence. So that's one of the major advantages I see of doing this in a fully digital workflow. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, just in case you didn't catch it, these are the two different platforms that we've integrated it with. On the left-hand side, the HoloLens, which is a um, transparent set of goggles. It's a little bit different to a VR headset. They are fully transparent, so you can see the world around you and the graphics are superimposed on top of the glasses. Um, so that you can see through them. That means your hands are completely free. So you can use a notebook if you like, you can use a scribe or a hand lens as you normally would. Um, you're totally free to do all of those traditional kind of core logging um, interactions that you would normally do. On the right hand side, we have something like an Android or an iPad uh, tablet, um, which just uses a very familiar, very approachable touchscreen interface to interact with the data. <laughs> yeah. And that's, sorry, that's just another illustration of those things that you've already seen. The fully virtual mode, like I said, uh, also exists. This, in this case, using a VR headset, um, no need to physically access the core. A significant advantage, I think, again, of opening up pre-competitive data to people that are located interstate or internationally, um, so they don't necessarily need to be physically in front of the core or have access to the core library. There are, there are huge collections that we can open up um, to different users um, by making a fully virtual version. Um, I can just see there's a question that's just popped up there actually about the resolution of the virtual core library. Um, so this relies on the scan data from HighLogger. Um, now HighLogger 3, I know has, has if you use any of the NVCL web services, you kind of get an indication of the quality of the imagery. Um, that's what we're using um, to visualize it here. I know HighLogger 4 has even more incredible resolution, I guess. We, there is some limitation in terms of what we can feasibly bring into a VR environment to make it performant. Um, but it, it, is, it is extremely high quality in terms of what's available. We do optimize it a little bit to bring it into the VR environment, but there's still a lot of textual information 
that you can pick up uh, on the basis of that. So I, I would argue it's it's very, very usable. Um, you can't physically rotate the core based on the Heilogger imagery because it doesn't collect um, three-dimensional photogram photogrammetry, for example. But there are other platforms like Minalize, for example, that do. And we, we could certainly look at ways to bring in that 3D information so that you're able to rotate the core as well. That, that is an option. All right, now I want to speak a little bit about the machine learning aspect. Um, many of you may have seen this mentioned. I know that, um, that the work that the Data Mosaic team at CSIRO is doing um, is, is really advancing um, at an incredible rate. Um, June Hill's team and so on um, have also just introduced the MyLogger platform that you may have seen being, um, being uh, communicated at a number of different fora recently. Um, so this is, this is not going away. This is something that's only going to increase in its uptake. And the way it works, for those of you that haven't seen it before, is it essentially takes a number of different variables that you can see on the left-hand side of that graph there, um, which could be, if you follow the codes on the far right-hand corner, um, different downhole uh, geochemistry variables, so iron, potassium, calcium, titanium, niobium, and so on, feeds them into a machine learning algorithm and then spits out a series of domains, um, as you can see on, on the graph there. Now those domains vary in scale. They can, it's basically, if you think of it in terms of lumping or splitting the data. So if you're, if you're really uh, interested in the high level subdivisions of the core down to the millimeter or the centimeter scale, you, you push the domain scale to the far left of that diagram. On the other hand, if you're mostly just interested in the very broad packages that exist within the drill hole, then you push it to the far right of the, of the diagram and the domain um, is much larger, okay? And what we have within the AR visualization tool is the ability to dynamically switch between those different ends of the domain classification and visualize that in situ. Now, to explain what I mean by that, what you can see here is the interface on the iPad, what the user is presented with, <coughs> and what the user is doing is adjusting the domain scale, which, which updates the very last bar graph that you can see at the top of the visualization there. So that's being ramped up and down. The color scale is being adjusted. But now the domain scale is being adjusted from to the far left at the low end of the domains to the far right where the domain scale is much larger. And you can see the visualization dynamically updating as you're doing that. And you can also see what, what the bar graphs that appear above that are a number of different downhole um, assays of various kinds so that you can assess the correspondence between to make a decision, I guess, about which domain scale is most appropriate for you. So if there's a particular feature in the downhill information, let's say it's the one of the geochemical variables that you want to pick out, you sort of adjust the domain scale until it's kind of aligning with that because that's what you're most interested in. <coughs> or equally, you might just want to look at the broadest subdivisions of the whole and you push the domain all the way to the right to the larger scales in order to pick that up as well. Now, once you convert that into the visualization, what you see, this is a simulated exercise here where we've got some printouts of the core in our lab at UniSA. And you can see as the user, what they're gonna do in a second is adjust that domain scale, the visualization updates dynamically. So in other words, it's going to pull out different segments of the, the core, different trays and different uh, proportions of that tray to say, hey, this is what I really want you to focus on because this is where the variation lies. This is where the algorithm has predicted a boundary. Um, and so what it does is it gets the geologist or the logger moving away from um, monotonous logging, I guess, if you like, and doing what they do best, which is actually focusing on the detail, where there's a contract, uh, sorry, where there's a contact, where there's a, where there's a change of some kind that the algorithm has predicted. Okay, so you're essentially going in and ground truthing things, which I think is a much more efficient way to do the actual logging process. Uh, and all of that is placed in situ, so you don't need to guess where that boundary um, has been predicted by the algorithm. It's labelled, it's right there for you to immediately go to and just assess the nature of that contact or that point of interest. Um, so there's a, there's a significant efficiency gain um, by taking this approach, allowing the algorithm to produce a pseudolog or a prediction of what it thinks is most significant, and then you go in and just ground truth that, verify, adjust it when necessary, and then convert the whole thing into a digital strat log. All right, so that is Log AR in a nutshell. Um, hopefully you've got a bit of an impression, I guess, of, of how that all comes together to change the way that we might do the, the logging process. What I want to shift gears to now is OSMAP, which is visualising um, the traditional kind of data sets, I guess, that we deal with in the exploration context. 
um, when we're looking to bridge scales, bring in different geophysical information, downhole information and so on, and view that together in a single immersive environment. <laughs> so again, this one came out of the uh, Minex CRC, uh, the Opportunity Fund. Um, the goals, again, you can read for yourself there, but really ultimately, like I said, we wanted to create a single tool rather than multiple different desktop software environments to view the typical inputs that are most useful in terms of informing our interpretation of a particular exploration question. So again, there's a video that I'll show you now that illustrates it. The YouTube link is there. I'll also give you a combined link at the end that you can refer back to if you want to revisit any of the stuff I'm showing you today. So this works in a VR environment as opposed to an AR environment. So you're fully immersed in this. And what you're presented with here is a freely nav navigable um, immersive environment where you can see a number of different um, traditional geophysical data, data sets being presented. So this is your starting point, the continental scale. And what we're doing now is we're zooming down to the deposit scale where you can see a number of different drill holes um, that have been placed. And it's much easier in an immersive environment to see the spatial relationships between those holes, how far down they go, what angles they're at, how they're positioned with respect to each other. Um, you can fully immerse yourself in that, I guess, and, and get a, a true appreciation of their scale uh, and the neighboring relationships. And then you can start to do things like present the downhole assays on those. And so suddenly, as soon as you do that, the correlations across holes, the intersections between them, and all of those sort of things become much more obvious. Now, the boreholes are just one example. There are several other examples given there of different types of spatial information that we can bring into the visualization, uh, whether that's raster information or layer information of some kind. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that we can visualize um, traditional um, kind of geophysical data sets, like the one you can see here, which is the Aerimag. Um, that we can bring a raster data set that we can superimpose on top of the boreholes um, to give us a bit more geophysical context. There are a number of different um, modelled um, surfaces, ISO surfaces you can see here that are based on interpretations of, I think in this case, um, a seismic wave speed data set, uh, which is the point cloud you can see here actually, I think. Um, you could model the resource, uh, the ore body itself, and show where it intersects those um, downhole assays that you can see from um, the borehole strings and that sort of stuff as well. Now, the other major advantage of doing this in an immersive environment is it can be completely collaborative. So what you're seeing here is a live collaboration between multiple users that are inhabiting the same virtual environment. Uh, they can talk to each other. They can use virtual laser pointers uh, to point out particular features. Uh, what you'll see in a second is that they can also annotate um, the environment as well. So they can draw on a fault structure. Um, a lineation, for example, you know, a, a, a connection between one ball hole and the other. You know, you can do all sorts of different annotations live that are synced between multiple users that are in the same um, VR environment. Um, and that's a fantastic way to bring teams together, preserving the spatial fidelity of all the data sets that you want to, that you want to visualize and start a much more informed, much more data rich conversation, I guess, about how to interpret what you're seeing there. So that's a significant advantage that we see, <coughs> excuse me, of being able to do this in a virtual environment. You, you can just imagine, I guess, the traditional seismic interpretation workshops that we run, where everyone needs to go to a single location. It's all done pretty much on, on pen and paper um, with a few digital bits and pieces that are brought into the process as well. Just imagine doing that in a fully remote um, context. Everyone's in, inhabiting the same virtual environment. Everyone's looking at seismic information and all the other related contextual information in true 3D with the spatial fidelity preserved. They can annotate on top of it. They can do all of that stuff. Um, it's just a very different way of approaching um, those kind of questions and those workshops and interactions that we want to do rather than the traditional approach um, that we've been doing for decades. So a lot of exciting opportunities, I guess, of how we can use that kind of technology to change up the way we're doing things. Um, now, I mentioned some of the different types of data sets that can be brought in. Um, there's a few examples listed there, and you would have seen those illustrated in the video. There's a few others that we're working on. There's a lot of different potentials here, um, so that it becomes a pretty powerful and diverse platform to bring in these different um, bits of information that we want to be able to visualize and interpret together. And the immersive collaboration, like I said, a really important capability, I think, that the virtual environment can offer. 
All right, so that's that's um, OSMAP in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to move on now to IMAX's Geo, which is this idea of similar to OSMAP in some respects, but bringing in a um, an analytical capability into the platform as well. Okay, so I'll illustrate what I mean by that in a second. Um, again, part of the MinFC, I see you're, you're getting a bit of a theme here um, through the Opportunity Fund. What we really want to do as, as part of this is Again, take much of the 2D and 3D information and the data sets that are hosted in the NDI portal and bring them into an immersive environment where we can start to analyze them differently. Again, using gestures, using um, true 3D, using all of these sort of things to hopefully give us new insights and new ways to interact with the data. And also, again, same thing, bring in multi-user collaboration um, so that we can have multiple people interacting with the same data together. Um, so what, what I mean by some of these immersive techniques, you can touch the data, you can twist it, you can pull it, you can combine axes using your hands. It's very different to what you would traditionally do with a keyboard and mouse on a desktop environment. Um, so we, we, we call these kind of embodied visualizations, I guess, um, that you can produce in the immersive environment that are very different and engage your brain in a very different way to what you traditionally do in a desktop environment. Okay, so you'll see some examples of that as we go through. Um, again, another video, the YouTube link is there for you to follow up again um, if you'd like to see this again, um, and I'll follow that up with a, with a consolidated list at the end of the presentation. So again, starting at the continental scale and zooming down, this is a data set from, this is Anthony Reid's data set actually from the St. Peter Suite on the Air Peninsula. You can see the individual spatial locations of each of the um, geochem assays in this case. And what the user is doing is starting to load up a bunch of different variables. So you can see the Horop geochem that's being brought up. And now what they're doing is what we call a sweep. So they're picking up one parameter, which is the, um, the silica data that you can see there, and sweeping it across all of the other geochemistry variables, um, either with that, that um, parallel kind of setup or by producing one of these emergent visualizations by combining the axes you can see there. Now that's designed to very efficiently look for correlations between the different parameters. And again, when you start to see those parameters and you want to interrogate them a bit more, you're starting to see this idea of twisting the data to reveal things in a little bit more clarity, I suppose. Building three-dimensional <coughs> visualizations, thresholding them to focus on just the things that are of most interest, I guess. So the, the user has a lot of flexibility in terms of the way that they can produce visualizations and start to interpret them. And so you can see them starting to build different things, looking at different variables and how they might um, have correlations between them, building 2D and 3D plots um, to look at the covariance between some of these variables and so on. So there's a lot of power, a lot of flexibility that the user has um, to produce these emergent visualizations and think about their data in a very different way. Um, so that's the idea of immersive, <laughs> excuse me, immersive analytics in a nutshell. Um, you can categorize the data if you want to, you can filter it, you can um, add in a third variable, you can, you can produce all kinds of different styles of visualization so that you can focus on the relationships that are most important to you in terms of getting sense out of the data. So a lot of flexibility there. Um, and the nice neat thing, I guess, is if you don't like any of the visualizations you produced and you're sick of them, you can just pick them up and throw them away. <laughs> so. Um, and a, a nice way to bring to get, vent some of your frustration with dealing with geochemistry sometimes in the VR environment. Okay, so another quick um, summary, I suppose, of that project. Um, what I'll do now um, is move on to the digital twin project. So a little bit of a change of pace, um, moving away from data analysis and interpretation, if you like, to simulation in a, in a virtual environment. Now. Um, where this came from, I suppose, is, um, sorry, I'll just pause there for a second before I show it, um, is um, the Rocksplorer drilling platform, this cold tubing drill, drilling um, system, which is very different to the, um, to the diamond um, kind of process that we traditionally use. The challenge there being, of course, that bringing that technology online means we need to train drillers in the new platform. Um, but we only have two rigs actually that physically exist in order to train these drillers on and they're often scattered to different parts of the globe, I guess, so that it's actually quite logistically challenge, challenging to bring people together in order to run those training sessions. 
So we thought, well, why don't we do it digitally, right? Why don't we do it in an immersive environment where we can use a digital twin to actually replicate um, the, uh, the Roxborough platform and conduct many of the initial familiarization and training activities in a virtual environment. And also to help with the commercialization process, bring people into it so they actually get a true sense of what the technology looks like, how it works, what all the different components are of this new style of drill site, if you like. So that's the motivation for producing this digital twin. Um, what you can see here is the, the twin itself. Okay, so um, hopefully you'll agree it's a quite an authentic replication of the rig itself. So this relies on the full engineering model of the digital twin. This is not a sort of dumbed down abstraction, if you like. It's the full engineering model down to the individual nuts and bolts that make it up. Um, so it's very accurate. It's very authentic, I guess, to what the actual drill site looks like. Everything's to scale as well and positioned accurately. And you can see the user has free control to navigate through the, the area, um, look at any, any of the individual components and start to um, get a feel for how they all tie together. <coughs> so this is what, in this video, what you'll see is some of the ways that the users can interact um, with this environment to, to pick up some of the, the important learnings that you might wanna do in a training and uh, familiarization exercise. So there are things like videos that illustrate many of the different processes. There are animations, in this case, that are highlighting the, the route that the drilling fluid takes between all the different components um, in the site. So in the, in the downhole assembly and, and the rig itself, all the way through to the HPS. Um, there are a bunch of other hazard notifications and other things that, that um, users can become aware of as they move through the scene, as you can see here. Um, there are several interactables as they go through, so you can see they can open gates, they can they can adjust levers, they can um, they can pick things up and interact with drill bits and other and, and sample bags and all of this sort of stuff. So it's it's designed to be a pretty authentic replication of of everything you can see, down to the individual um, processes you can see here, the the control systems um, and all of those bits and pieces, so that people who are using the visualization tool, get a very accurate sense, I suppose, of how everything's laid out, how all the different bits and pieces um, interact on the drill site, the things they need to be conscious of, um, the learning that they can take away from that, um, and so on and so forth. So um, it's, it's designed to be as close as we can get to being on the drill site itself without actually being there. And there's, there's some significant safety benefits from doing that, right? You can make mistakes, you can, um, pick up things and so on in, in a virtual environment in a totally safe manner that you couldn't easily do with an inex inexperienced person um, if they were on the drill site itself. So there's there's a lot of advantages to the training process that we have by virtue of that um, uh, doing it in a fully virtual environment. So what you can see here again, some of the control systems that you can interact with. What the what the user is doing now is adjusting the uh, adjusting the the, the the reel as you can see there. You can raise and lower. Um, the platform and the downhole assembly. Um, you can raise and lower the mast. <laughs> All of those things that um, the operator will need to become familiar with as they're going through the drill site. Um, so all of that is is easy to interact with um, and start to practice on. And what you'll see, I think, in a second, is some of the collaborative aspects as well. Um, so again, we wanted to be able to bring multiple users into the environment. So in this case, you can have an instructor and you can have multiple users. The instructor is there to guide people through the training environment. Um, and here again, you can have things like laser pointers and annotation tools and various other things so that the users can in become intimately familiar, I guess, with all the different components that make up the drill site whilst they're being guided by the instructor. Um, and all of that, that, they don't need to be physically co-located when they're doing that either. So anyone can sit at their desk with a headset on anywhere in the world and inhabit the same VR environment, be led by an instructor um, through the process and have that two-way verbal communication as well. Um, so that you get, you get a real benefit of bringing together pretty diverse teams in different locations, all into the same scene um, and conducting the training exercise or the commercialization discussion or whatever it happens to be, um, all in that virtual environment. All right, now, um, this is where the interactive component of the talk comes in, I guess. There is the QR code that you can see there on the screen because um, not only do we want to run this sort of thing in a VR environment, in a headset, but we also want to be able to do it in the real world. Okay, so if you access the QR code there, 
Um, you can do it now. I know that um, Chris and Matilda have also organised some printouts for those of you based in Canberra to check out um, after today's session. Um, you can access the um, you can access the drill uh, rig on your phone actually as well to give you to place it in your local environment and, and get a sense of its scale and its features and so on. Now I will say just to, um, before everyone gets too excited, the QR code you can see there only works with iPhones and iPads, unfortunately. So Apple's AR kit is significantly superior to anything else out there on the market in terms of viewing AR content. Um, it, it preserves all the materials and textures and so on of the of the model really, really well. And it also doesn't require an app download in order to work. So that's why we've kind of used it. It makes it super accessible um, for those that do have an iPad or an iPhone to get access to these uh, models and visualize them. And it's, and it's a really high quality, um, high performance kind of way to view the AR stuff. Um, so um, you will be restricted to that in this particular instance. But if you, for those of you that don't have an iPad or an iPhone, this is kind of what it looks like once you've got it all up and running. So this is the rig placed outside of our, our lab at UniSA Mawson Lakes. And you can see that you can place the AR model in front of the building. It's true to scale. Um, you get a, an idea of how it might be spatially laid out, I guess, in the environment and what it can do um, and all of its different features and so on. Um, you get to walk around it and, and get a true true sense of scale. You can also scale it down if you want to reduce it to a, a sort of a desktop scale, I guess, and uh, and interrogate it that way. So multiple different ways to interact with it. Way better than looking at an IKEA couch, which is the, <laughs> which I guess is the traditional approach to it to AR on a mobile. Um, uh, a rock explorer is yeah much 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 cooler thing maybe to take home to the, the friends and family and show them what, what what it might look like in the lounge room as opposed to whatever ikea is offering these days so definitely definitely do that if you get a chance all right so that's the digital twin in a nutshell what i'm going to finish up on just in the last few minutes um, is our flinders rangers vr experience that we've been producing in support of the world heritage nomination so again total change of pace moving away from the industry um, kind of stuff, um, if you like, to the science communication and outreach things that we do as part of Project Live. So why are we doing this? Well, we want people to be able to engage with the World Heritage process. Um, we want the local communities, we want those that are interested, um, uh, the various other stakeholders outside of just the, the research and the, the government um, participants in that process to be able to, to come along for the ride. Um, the World Heritage dossier that's being produced is a very technical document. It's, it's so reliant on the science and it has to be. Um, that's, that's what UNESCO requires in order to assess the, the, the actual application. But that's very that's almost impenetrable for the, the, the lay person, I guess. Um, so we wanted to take the core elements of that, the, the reasoning um, for putting forward this nomination, the scientific value, the heritage value, the cultural value of the Flinders, and produce it in a way that's very approachable. Uh, for the common person, I guess, that doesn't have that, that technical background. Um, and we thought, what better way to do that than do it in VR, we, where it can be immersive, it can be really compelling and authentic as well. So what we did is produce a, an experience where there are a number of different portals. Now, <coughs> we want to produce seven in total. We've done three of those at present, which is what you can see in the, 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 um, uh, the virtual experience that, that's now available on our website. Um, but encompassing many of the different key themes to do with the Flinders Ranges and its history. Um, so all the ones you would expect to see um, from the, the origin of life with the Ediacaran uh, fossils all the way through to the Ackerman impact, uh, Snowball Earth, the geothermal systems that we have there and so on and so forth. And of course, um, all the Aboriginal um, heritage um, that we want to discuss as well and the mining heritage as well. So a lot of stories, a lot of great narratives that we want to communicate as part of this experience. And it's done by virtue of the characters that you can see there. So we have a number of different protagonists, I guess, that go through each of the different portals. Um, we've got Professor Flint to talk about the Ediacaran. We've got Pegleg Blinman to talk about the discovery of copper at Blinman and the mining heritage there. And we've got Dawn, who's your intrepid ge geologist, that kind of, she's the central character that kind of guides you through each of the different portals as well. So it's designed to make it very um, relatable, I guess, uh, for a general audience. We're kind of pitching at a kind of secondary school level, if you like, um, but opening it up to everyone to, to check out. So um, let's give you a sense, I guess, of what that all looks like when it comes together. So here's a bit of a trail.
Welcome to the extraordinary Flinders Ranges. What's weird, slimy, and lived long, long ago under the sea? Is that copper I spy in those hills? Ready to take an incredible journey? Let's begin the remarkable story of life in the Flinders Ranges. So that's a bit of a showcase, I guess, of what the experience looks like. It is uh, something that can be downloaded from our website for anyone to try. And there's a bunch of other um, desktop-based resources and mobile-based resources, I guess, that you can access as well to try out. Now, in, in um, an extension of the project as well, what we've done um, is work with the South Australian Science Teachers Association to produce a bunch of educational resources linked to it as well. So for the first time now, actually, this year, we have a Ediacaran teaching resource, which is being made available to all secondary science teachers um, teaching the Australian curriculum for science. <coughs> it's pitched at, at the year eight level. Um, and it involves, it, it incorporates content from our virtual experience. It has a whole bunch of teaching modules and various things to communicate the key messages um, around the Ediacarans and get students to do a bunch of activities associated with them. Um, and that can be accessed via the link that you can see there. Um, it's a free resource. You do, you do need to just log on to the website and register an account. But that's it. It's totally free. And you can access all of the different uh, materials that um, SASTA um, and the Ediacra Foundation and the SA Department for Education have put together um, using a bunch of our materials. Um, so I would encourage you to check that out if you've got that interest in the educational side of, of geoscience. Um, it's like I said, it's the first time we've actually had the ability to incorporate local geoscientific content into the science curriculum with a fully resourced um, curriculum module, I guess, um, for teachers to use. And that's what they're craving, right? That's why this stuff isn't much more widely used. Um, the teachers don't have the resources, they don't have the materials that are locally relevant to bring that into the curriculum. So hopefully this is an important first step so that we can start to see more of this being communicated and exposed to our students um, at the primary and the secondary level. So I do encourage you to check out that link and certainly happy to follow up with anyone that's got more, more questions about that aspect. Um, we've also been trying to take this on the road, right? So to get more people involved, to get more people interested, Here's a photo of myself and Professor Flint at Port Augusta um, a few weeks back um, where we ran an exhibit at the, um, at the Yard of Perth, the Art Gallery there involving a bunch of the local schools where we had the students uh, having a chance to check out the VO environment. And this was so nice, I guess, because it, they are at the doorstep of the Flinders Ranges out in Port Augusta. Um, they're learning about their local environment. And, and that's the, the tragedy, I guess, of much of this is that these students that are hop, skip and a jump away from these places don't learn about this stuff. They don't get exposed to us, exposed to it. They don't know that these things live in their own backyard. These incredible stories about our, our geoscientific heritage. So we're trying to change that. And this was a, a starting point, I guess, for getting them to, to hear these stories about why these things are so important. Um, so yeah, we went to Port Augusta. We also took it to Kids on Country, which is the local Aboriginal um, communities um, based around South Australia, um, run through the Nature Foundation. So we took it to the Gore Rangers and Wichelina um, and had the local Aboriginal um, kids having a chance to check this out as well. So trying to disseminate it amongst, amongst a number of these communities as well to, to, to get everyone that has such a stake 
and the knowledge that we're trying to communicate being involved in this process as well. Now, we didn't just include it in the VR environment. Um, we wanted to make this tangible as well um, by 3D printing some of the assets that we produced as well. And that's that was done through our test lab that you can see there. Um, we actually 3D printed a bunch of the Ediacaran fossils so people have things to touch and feel um, and get a sense of how, how these things actually look. And so these 3D pr printed fossils um, that are part of the immersive underwater experience, um, taking back to the H and Ediacaran seabed, these are now being used by tour guides through Brachina Gorge. Um, they, they wanted a goodie bag, if you like, of these things to share with, with people that are going through the um, going through the, uh, the tour experience, I guess, there. It's very hard when you're just seeing the impressions on the rock to actually get a sense of what these things look like, how big they were, what their features were. Um, but when you've got this in front of you in a bit of a show bag, it, it becomes much more tangible, much more real. Um, so that was a really, a really nice way to close the loop and bring our work out to those local communities and being used by the tour guides, as we said, um, through many of the key locations through the Flinders as well. And you can also take it home with you, right? So this is another AR experience um, that you can check out um, using your phone. You'll be able to bring up one of the Ediacan fossils and have it on your phone. Again, much better than an IKEA couch. Bring, bring a, a Kimberella or a Dickinsonia into your lounge room and show people what that would look like. Um, so if you follow that QR code, again, iPad and iPhone only, um, but you can check that out. Um, and bring that fossil to life. And again, there'll be some printouts um, that uh, those in person at Canberra um, will have access to. So you can follow that QR code after the session um, to check it out. There's, a, there's actually a few, few different <coughs> ones that we can show. Now, I haven't left everyone that has an Android out of this process, um, because if you do, there is this link as well, which runs through the Cospaces app. Um, uh, so if you do follow that link, you'll, you'll need to download the Cospaces app, but you will be able to access this kind of digital diorama, if you like, or AR diorama of a, an Ediacaran scene, where you can see all the fossils in situ and get a sense of what they all look like. <coughs> so if you do have an Android device, then, then please do follow the link you can you can do there, downloading the Cospaces app, um, and you should be able to check that out and interact with it. Um, and it's just an example, I guess, of what we can do with some of these AR models. Um, once we've got them, we can sort of build these experiences um, for, for some nice kind of educational benefits, I think. All right, so that's about it for me. Here are the links that I promised, I guess, that explain each of these different um, projects that we've been working on. So please do follow those if you like um, to learn a little bit more about what we've been doing. Um, um, so, and uh, and explore some of the desktop based um, resources that we've also got. If you don't have a headset, there's a lot still to check out there and a number of the videos as well um, to share and explore also. Um, so please do follow those links to, to pick up on all that info. Otherwise, um, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks everyone for listening um, and, and uh, for all your questions and so on and um, enjoy. Thank you, Professor Raimondo, and I'm sure everyone will um, celebrate and applaud that talk um, virtually um, for your hands going up there.